Isaiah chapter 31 and 32 tonight. Hope you have your Bibles open. If you don't have one with you, there should be one under your chair. And uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time we can spend together in your word, reading your word, reading what you had to say to the, uh, your children, the children of Israel so many years ago. But also, Lord, reading of your faithfulness, your goodness, your trustworthiness, learning more about the God that we serve, Lord. Thank you so much that you never change. Thank you so much for Jesus, and thank you that he is our king, and we have so many promises in him. I pray, Lord, that you would help us see these things tonight as we look at your word. We pray that you teach us through your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, many of us have probably played at work retreats, that old, uh, it's almost cliched now, that team-building exercise of trust. Uh, we know one person falls backwards and and trusting that a group is going to support that person, break the fall. And invariably, there's some joker in the crowd who wants to let the person fall a little too far back. You know, and it's no wonder it's so difficult to trust people because people are often, too often, less than trustworthy. But not so with God. God is supremely trustworthy. God, of course, can be trusted more than any human, more than any army, more than any strategy, more than anything else that the world has to offer. And sadly, this is something that we too often forget. We forget what the Lord has already done for us, and we forget what the Lord has promised to us, and we start to turn our attention to other things. And that was a problem for the kingdom of Judah. That was a problem for the city of Jerusalem when they were facing the dangerous Assyrian Empire. When they were posed with what seemed to be an insurmountable threat, they forgot their current relationship with God. They forgot their future promises in God. And in short, they forgot who is most trustworthy. And that's a fact to which Isaiah is calling them to repentance. And so he starts off in chapter 31 and starts talking about the results of not trusting the Lord, uh, starting in verse 1 through 3. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because there are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Now, if you've been with us the last several weeks going through Isaiah, you've noticed that every chapter since chapter 28 has started with a woe, and chapter 31 continues the trend here. The subject in chapter 31 is actually the same as chapter 30. The people of Judah were seeking assistance from the Egyptians and their struggle against this Assyrian threat. The Assyrian Empire, their armies were marching all through the Mideast, and they were conquering everything in its path. And so the Jews were rightly fearing what was going on, what was coming to them. But instead of seeking the Lord in humility and faith, instead of praying and fasting and doing these things that the Lord would have called them to do, they seemingly tried to form an alliance with Egypt. Now, remember, Egypt were their former slave owners. If there was one place they were told not to go back to was Egypt, but that's exactly what they were doing. Now, Egypt was nowhere close to the world power that they had once been, not in the light of the Assyrian threat, but they were bent on, the Jews were bent on getting whatever help that they could, and so they were going to Egypt and not to God. And woe to those who would do such a thing. That's what Isaiah says. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Well, why? Well, because they'd only bring harm to themselves. They would be trusting in empty help. They would be trusting in an army that could not help them, an army that itself would be defeated. They'd be trusting in their own efforts, and those own efforts would be doomed to failure. And so woe to them. Why is that? Because they could have assured success. Why trust Egypt when you could trust God? And that's what Isaiah is pointing out here. The Jews had an open invitation from the Lord. He was their God. He was their sovereign protector. And Isaiah even reminds them of their covenant relationship with God. How does he describe him here? As the Holy One of Israel, as the Lord, the covenant-keeping, ever-existent God. That's what's wrapped up in the name, the Lord. See, God was not the God of Assyria. He's not the God of Egypt. He's the Holy One of Israel. He had this unfettered, covenant, promised relationship with Israel They had this relationship with the living God if they but bothered to trust him. Seems very reminiscent, I think, this verse does, of Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. Many of us have this memorized. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's what they should have been doing. They could have looked to the Holy One of Israel. They could have sought the Lord. 
Blessed is the person who seeks the Lord. Some of us are going to trust in chariots. Some are going to trust in human aspects. But we, we need to remember the name of the Lord. Brings up a good point, by the way. We need to intentionally make the choice to trust God. A lot of people think, well, eventually I'll come around to that point. It'll just be second nature. Well, it might be second nature if you've done it over and over and over again. That's the way anything becomes a habit, is if you do it over and over and over again. But if you never first make that choice to intentionally trust the Lord, then it's never just going to magically happen to you one day. You have to make that choice. Today, I'm not going to trust all that other advice that people have been shoving at me nonstop. And I know that sounds good because that's what I've always done before. Today, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to take what the Bible says. I'm going to believe God at his word. Verse 2, yet he also is wise and will bring disaster. Will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers against the help of those who work iniquity. Uh, there's a little hint of sarcasm here. A lot of the prophets and even some of the apostles had the spiritual gift of sarcasm, and you see it kind of coming out here. Uh, you know, he also is wise. Yes, God, by the way, he's wise. That's kind of the way it's coming across. So would it seem wise in the eyes of Judas counselors to seek outside help from the Egyptians? No doubt the advisors of Jerusalem would be in agreement. It was a good thing to do. Let's go to Egypt for help, but how much better is it to trust the Lord? God also, by the way, he's wise. He knows what's going on. God is wiser than the wisest of men. And not only is God wiser, but he's more powerful, right? There's no guarantee that Egypt would be able to succeed in battle. In fact, God would know they could not. Nobody was going to be stopping the Assyrians as they came through, but there's no doubt about the Lord. When God rises up to go to battle, he what will bring disaster upon his enemies, He would even bring down those who would assist the evildoers. Call down against the help of those who work iniquity. Verse 3, now the Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down. They will perish together. Now there's an understatement in there. The Egyptians, they're men. They're not God. The Egyptians are not omnipotent. The Egyptians did not create the heavens and the earth. The Egyptians did not split the Red Sea and bring the Hebrews into the promised land. They're just men. They're nothing like God. God is the one who did all those things. Why put your trust in men? Go to God. We talked about the analogy last week. Why go into battle with a pop gun when you could go in with a Patriot missile? And that's what the choice that they were making here. They're just men. They're not God. Go in with God. The Egyptians are limited As any human is limited, it's not just the Egyptians, it's any human tactic is limited. But God is totally without limit. God has nothing restraining him, nothing holding him back. Who could rush into the battle like the Lord? Who can sweep in with the spirit and bring complete victory like the Lord? Well, no one. Only God is God. And it's such an obvious fact. And we think, well, how sad is it that this even needs to be said? You know, of course, they're not as powerful as God because only God is God. But yet even God's own people need to be reminded of this. God's own people who saw the Red Sea split and who saw the blessings of the promised land, who had the history of miracle after miracle after miracle, they had to be reminded only God is God in Egypt. Well, they're just men. And we need to be reminded of this too. Think of the things we've seen as believers in Christ. We've been raised from death to life. We've been given an eternal inheritance, made joint heirs with Jesus. And yet, too often, we turn to the world and experts and strategies to plan out the responses to our problems. And we flip the channel and find the TV show that has the best advice that sounds best for us. But those things are the ways of men. They're not the ways of God. They're just men. They're not God. God's ways are infinitely better. You know, unlike the limited Egyptians, when uh, God stretches out his hand, things happen. God smites the enemy. He takes down both the helper and the helped, which ought to be a sobering reminder to Judah. After all, he who helps, that's an obvious reference to Egypt. So who is it that he who is helped? Well, that's got to be the Jews. They were the ones seeking the help of the Egyptians, yet by trusting in them instead of the Lord, they were putting themselves in, themselves in danger from the Lord. You're going to trust them. God's going to let you trust them. And he's going to let you experience the consequences that come as a result. And sometimes God does allow us to experience the consequences of our actions when we refuse to trust in him. And more than that, sometimes those consequences are his direct discipline because we refused to trust in him. And that's what 
Israel was putting themselves in danger of. And so they've got that, but they've also got God's promise of deliverance, starting in verse 4. For thus the Lord has spoken to me, as a lion roars and a young lion over his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor be destroyed nor be disturbed by their noise. So will the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. Like birds flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it, passing over it, he will preserve it. Two pictures from the animals are given. The first, the Lord God is like a lion. Second, the Lord God is like a flock of birds. First, the Lord God is like a roaring lion hunched over his prey. Now that lion's not going to be frightened off. That lion's not going to be intimidated by a bunch of shepherds coming at him, you know, to, to try to take a, a carcass away from a hungry lion. That's a pretty dangerous proposition. I don't care how many people you have there, right? The shepherds, they're going to find themselves as much prey as the animal uh, that the lion already killed. And the lion instead is going to roar with deafening noise, intimidating the shepherds, causing them to flee. And that's the picture painted here. That's the way the Lord God would be in regards to Jerusalem. The city of Zion, Jerusalem, might be threatened, but God would preserve his city according to his promise with all the power and might necessary to do so. He himself would rise up in his defense as a furious lion. That's the first picture. Second, God is like a flock of birds surrounding Jerusalem. Now, some have imagined this as God's tender side as a mother bird caring for her chicks. And although God truly does love and care for his people in this way, that's not really the picture painted here by this text. There's no mother bird mentioned. There's a bunch of birds flying about in defense and deliverance of Jerusalem. So imagine this massive cloud of ravens or hawks descending upon the city, surrounding the walls of Jerusalem, sweeping down upon the enemy, delivering the Jews in battle, causing the city to be preserved. That's more the idea. It's like a scene out of Alfred Hitchcock, except, you know, they're defending the people of God. That's kind of the idea here. God's coming down in warfare in birds to protect his people. Both analogies speak of the awesome power of God as he rises up in defense of Jerusalem. And that's what he offered to do for his people, yet they're in danger of rejecting this incredible defense. Why? Because instead they want to trust in unstable Egypt. How foolish is that? Well, look what you could have, and look what you're putting yourself into. How foolish can we be when we do the same thing? Look what we have in almighty, infinite God, and yet we put ourselves in the hands of this unstable advice from the world. It's just utter foolishness. So he says in verse 6, Return to him, against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day, every man shall throw away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, sin which your own hands have made for yourselves. So with the idea of God's supernatural defending power in mind, Isaiah presents this call to repentance. He's saying, come back to the Lord. Don't continue to revolt against the God who loves you, this God who's sworn to protect you as his people. Brings up a really good point. When we refuse to trust in the Lord, our God, we're God's people, he's our Lord. When we refuse to trust in him, God sees that as sin. The children of Israel, they had revolted against God in this manner. They were his people, yet they refused to call on him. They ignored him. That was sin. They were revolting against him. So do we when we act likewise. Now, Thankfully, the people wouldn't always revolt. There would come a day where they would truly trust the Lord. They cast aside all their idols that they had made. The people would despise these things as a garbage for what they were. That wasn't in that day. Would come one day that they would do that. And by the way, do we recognize our own idols as garbage? Uh, that's what it is. It's refuse meant to be thrown out. Verse 8, Then Assyria shall fall by a sword, not of man. And a sword, not of mankind, shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall become forced labor. So regarding this immediate threat of Assyria, the proclamation is clear. Assyria shall fall. They would most definitely be defeated, but they would not be defeated by human strategies. They would not be defeated by human armies. They would flee from battle. They would face total defeat. But the devouring of the army of Assyria would not come by a sword of mankind. So if not by whom, uh, not by man, then by whom? Well, by the Lord, by the Lord God Almighty. And of course, this is a reference to the supernatural defeat of Sennacherib's armies outside the gates of Jerusalem. You might recall the city had been under siege. We're going to read about this in a few weeks when we get there in uh, Isaiah because the account from 2 Kings is repeated in Isaiah. 
city had been under complete siege, nothing coming in, nothing going out, the people were starving, the, the odds seemed insurmountable, yet Assyria, this mighty army that nothing had stood in the way with, even all through Judea until they finally came to Jerusalem, no city had stood in the way of Assyria, but Assyria fell mightily before the Lord. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were killed in a single night. And we're not told exactly how many had come throughout the land of Judea, but there's no doubt that any who were left in the general area turned tail and fled as soon as they could. You know, historically, there are no Assyrian records of this military defeat apart from the pages of the Bible. And that's not really unexpected considering, you know, ancient military journals record victories rather than humiliations. But there are records of the Assyrians marching through the, the Mideast. The Assyrians do record their march through Judea. They record their victory at the uh, Judean city of Lachish. Um, and you see a carved relief. You can find that in the British Museum today. It was found in Sennacherib's palace. But they get rather quiet in regards to Jerusalem. There is one artifact that apparently records Sennacherib's own version of the events. It's called the Taylor Prism or the Sennacherib Prism. I actually have a picture for you there. That, that's what it looked like. And uh, he, column three is where the siege of Jerusalem is recorded. And on this thing, the Sennacherib records and brags about all the city that he conquers. But when it comes to Jerusalem's siege, it's interesting because he writes of the tribute money that he received from King Hezekiah. Which is interesting. Because there's no attempt to even try to describe an Assyrian conquest of Jerusalem. Describes a really long siege, but no conquest, no military victory, just money. It, it would seem that Sennacherib bragged about what he could brag about, and probably a little bit more, but he left a lot unsaid. He doesn't mention his defeat, but he certainly couldn't mention a victory either. Why? Because God had the victory. If you lay siege that long, you're going to conquer the city, but he never conquered the city. Why? Well, he was turned back by the Lord. All Assyria could do is turn tail and run. And that's what's saying in verse 9. He shall cross over to a stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Assyria would flee from Jerusalem, going back to their place of stronghold. So defeated by the God of Israel, they'd quake in fear at the mere sight of the battle flag of Judah. That's the, the, the banner. And when God defeats an enemy, of course, that enemy is absolutely defeated. And this is something that the people of Jerusalem could be assured of. They had the promise of the Lord on the matter. This is the God of Israel. This is the all-consuming fire whose own fire of sacrifice, the temple altar, was in Jerusalem. God would not forsake his own people ever, and he's promising to protect them. And neither will God forsake us. He will never leave us. He'll always be with us, even to the end of the age. He will defend us. We know the verses, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Christian, we need to remember whom it is that we serve. We don't have to fear our changing culture. We don't have to fear spiritual attacks of the enemy. We are servants and children of the Most High God. And He defends His people. And not only will God protect them in the coming days against the Assyrians, He also has a wonderful promise for them in the future kingdom. And that's what He's going on to prophesy of in chapter 32. The blessings of this promised kingdom, starting in verse 1. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and as a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. A king will reign. There are different thoughts as to the identity of this king. Some suppose that uh, Isaiah is writing chapter 32 at an earlier time than chapter 31. It is possible we see through many of the prophets that uh, they're recorded, but not necessarily in chronological order, and perhaps... These Well, these scholars do things, but perhaps that Isaiah uh, wrote this at a much earlier time prior to the reign of King Hezekiah. And so this would be a reference to Hezekiah. Hezekiah was truly a righteous king, one of the great kings of Judah. The problem is that the overall context doesn't really seem to have changed at all. Later in chapter 32, there's still a promise of judgment of not from Assyria, than from Babylon, perhaps more. If chapter 32 was indeed written about the same time as chapter 31, couldn't it be Hezekiah then because Hezekiah is already on the throne. But it could be possible it could refer to the coming king Josiah. Now, Josiah later on would be another righteous reign in Jerusalem. It would be the last righteous reign before Jerusalem was overthrown and taken into the captivity of Babylon. 
Remember Josiah? He would rediscover the written word of God. He would celebrate the Passover in glorious fashion, bring reform to the nation. It'd be a wonderful time in Jerusalem. Now, with all that in mind, although Hezekiah and Josiah could foreshadow the time spoken of here, no normal king in Jerusalem could truly fulfill it. Every king in Israel's history was still just a man. No royal court was ever perfectly just. If we're going to take these words for what it says, then the fulfillment of this time can only really refer to the promised millennial kingdom in which Jesus reigns in righteousness as the son of David. His princes are whom? His princes are those who share in his inheritance. That's us, by the way. You and me, the church, we're co-heirs, joint heirs with the Lord Jesus. There's none as righteous as our King Jesus. There'll be no time on earth as a time during his magnificent rule during that restored kingdom. His justice will be perfectly accomplished upon the earth and Somehow, in all of his infinite wisdom and grace, he chooses to let us take part in the process. And that's amazing. The righteous reign of Jesus will manifest itself through all those who are brought into the kingdom. And all men and women will be shelters to one another, helps to one another. We will have compassion on one another like we ought to have always had compassion. That's what it's talking about here, being a hiding place and a cover. Having compassion on one another would be a wondrous time. Be life on earth as it would always could have been. Those who enter that kingdom, of course, who are they? Well, part of it's the church. We will have been raptured by Jesus just prior to the Great Tribulation. The others that enter that kingdom will be those who came to faith in Christ during the years of the Great Tribulation. Thus, we will all act according with the righteousness that Jesus works within us. What else goes on there? Well, verse 3, the eyes of those who see will not be dim. The ears of those who hear will listen. Also, the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. So during that kingdom, we will all experience all kinds of blessing. Not only will we have compassion upon one another, not only will we know the perfect reign of King Jesus and help him minister his rule, but we will experience the blessings of sight, of hearing, of speech, of understanding. It's primarily a reference, of course, to spiritual sight, but there's no reason to think that physical aspects aren't included in this at all. Don't you love that? There's no need for corrective lenses in the kingdom of God. All that stuff has gone away with. There's no need for physical assistance of any kind. Beyond that, we're going to see and hear clearly. We'll be able to understand perfectly. We'll be able to articulate our understanding. We have got so many questions to the Lord right now about every sort of thing going on in our life. But those things, they're not going to be issues in the kingdom. We're going to see our king. We're going to have a wonderful understanding of who he is, of what he's done, what he's got for us to do. You know, this is one of the things Paul seems to refer to when he's writing to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts. And there are some gifts that are necessary today that will not be necessary in the kingdom or in eternity. You know, there's no need for prophecy when one can directly hear the words of Jesus from Jesus. There's no need for tongues when there's no need for the supernatural sign because, again, we're looking at Jesus right there. We will be in the presence of the perfect, and a lot of those things are going to have passed away. And all of that, there's a wonderful blessing of understanding. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 11, and 12, When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Isn't that a wonderful promise? that we would have this understanding of God given to us by God, knowing the things of God just as much as we are known by God. That understanding, that perfect understanding comes. Now, with all this in mind, we need to remember, talking about the future kingdom, the millennial kingdom, uh, the population of the kingdom isn't going to remain static. Everybody who enters the kingdom enters as a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, But those who come into the kingdom having survived the great tribulation, well, they're still going to be alive and physically active and still able to have children. They're going to come up future generations during that thousand years. And of course, it'd be a perfect thousand years. Satan, we know, is in prison, but they're going to be raised in a perfect environment. Not even that's going to be enough to save them from uh, the very nature of human sinfulness. That aspect of the curse is not going to be completely done away with until the eternal state of the new heavens and the new earth eventually some within those future generations begin acting in foolishness. And that's what it's going to go on to explain here. The difference, though, is that while in this current era, foolish sin goes virtually unchecked, 
and the kingdom is going to be recognized for what it is. Look at it in verse 8. The foolish person, speaking of the same promised kingdom, the context hasn't changed. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful, for the foolish person person will speak foolishness and his heart will work iniquity to practice ungodliness to utter error against the lord to keep the hungry unsatisfied and will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail the foolish person during those days will be exposed for who he is no longer will there be questions of injustice no longer will there be people in positions of power and authority that have no business whatsoever being there nepotism is not going to gain somebody's favor bribes aren't going to hold any weight there won't be any political compromise or anything like that no righteousness will be recognized as righteousness foolishness will be seen as foolishness now there are several things that describe the foolish person here first the foolish person sins indeed uh, his heart works what iniquity to practice ungodliness these are the things he desires to do the foolish person rushes towards sin spending times devising ways and going about it second the foolish person sins in doctrine he utters error against the lord seemingly twisting to make the scripture say something what it's not saying. The example here might be to use the things of the Lord to somehow keep the hungry unsatisfied. And people often twist scripture out of context as an excuse for their own sin. It's foolish to do so. Third, the foolish person lacks compassion. He's not generous. He works against the hungry. He works against the thirsty. The foolish person does not exemplify the compassion of Christ. Why? Because he probably hasn't ever truly experienced and tasted it for himself. It's not just the foolish, it's also the schemer. Look at verse 7. Also, the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. What's the difference between the foolish person and the schemer? Not really a lot. They really almost seem to be overlapping terms. One might, out of neglect, uh, engage in foolishness. The other, acts in purposeful wickedness, that would be the schemer. Verse 7 describes a person who's actively trying to destroy the weak and pervert justice but again here's the good news although these things will be attempted in the kingdom age they won't succeed sins will be seen for what they are and will be immediately dealt with by the just lord jesus and isn't it good to know that that's coming isn't it good to remember the promises of god in the future kingdom you know we live in an unjust world today and it's unjust on a lot of levels but it won't always be that way. This world is corrupted by sin, but the kingdom of God will remain free from such corruption. We deal with injustice now. We just deal with it because that's just the time in which we live. But one day, all that will change. Our Lord Jesus will govern that age in absolute perfection. It says in verse 8, but a generous man devises generous things. and By generosity, he shall stand. Just as the foolish and the schemers are known by their actions, so are the generous or the noble, some translations. Those who act according to the righteousness and compassion of Christ, it'll be evident. It's often said today, no good deed goes unpunished, but not in the kingdom. In the kingdom, those things are known for what they are. Now, it's with these promises of the righteous kingdom in mind that Isaiah turns his attention back to the present-day troubles for uh, Judah. There is a glorious kingdom in the future, but that time was not just yet for the Jews. They had other things approaching them. They needed to be aware of them. And so he starts warning them of coming trouble, starting in verse 9. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year and some days you will be troubled, you complacent women. For the vintage will fail, the gathering will not come. So here's this wake-up call from Isaiah. To those who were at ease in their comfortable lives, is addressed primarily here to the women of Jerusalem, but applied to everybody who is there, they were not to grow too comfortable. They were at ease now. They experienced relative peace in the land. They didn't have their eyes looking upon the future. And Isaiah is calling out to them. They're saying, listen up, wake up, trouble is coming. The peace that you have now, it's not going to last. A little over a year's time, trouble would descend upon them. The harvest they gathered this year won't necessarily be there the next. Trouble was on the horizon. They needed to be alert to the times in which they lived. By the way, so do we. We need to understand the days in which we live. Too many Christians in American evangelicalism are asleep. We're relatively free from persecution. We're relatively free from hardship. So we've tended to close our eyes to our brothers and sisters around the world who experience these things every single day. We've had teachers, all sorts of teachers piled up around us, and we've tended to grow lazy in our discernment. 
not taking the things we're taught back to the scripture to see if they're really true. When we take an honest look at our culture and times, it ought to be obvious we're living in the last days. And yet many of us, and I'll include myself in this, we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, we've got all the time in the world to get it done. Well, no, we don't. We need to wake up. We need to be aware of the times in which we live and not waste a second of it. He says in verse 11, Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, and gird sackcloth on your waist. To the women Isaiah was speaking to, the call was simple. It says, repent, don't be easy, don't be complacent, beware. You need to be ready that trouble's on the horizon. They needed to humble themselves before God in sackcloth and ashes and repent. Interestingly, it's likely a reference here to the coming Assyrian invasion in mind, and that's what Isaiah is writing about here. You know, when the Assyrian city of Nineveh was to be judged, only one prophet was sent to them, Jonah, who seemingly uttered only one sentence in their presence. And got, that was enough to bring the whole city to repentance, humbling themselves in sackcloth and ashes from the king on down. Yet with Israel and Jerusalem, whole books had been written, many prophets had been sent, and the people still didn't humble themselves in repentance. God had made it clear what was coming, and the people were complacent and apathetic. They just didn't care. When God speaks, we've got to pay attention. What is he saying and respond in humility and faith? Verse 12, people shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. Yes, and all the happy homes and the joyous city. Because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. See, this is what was coming to them. The blessings of the land would be lost. The fruitful fields would be barren. They'd bring up thorns. The homes and palaces would be lost. The city itself would be deserted. What was once the joyous city of Jerusalem would be left as a byword, a place where animals roam rather than the people of God. And we've got to understand this is a reversal of the blessings that God gave to the people when they came into the promised land. God promised them when they were coming in that he was going to give them lands that they didn't plant, vineyards that they didn't plant, cities that they didn't build, and give them all these things that they didn't labor for, Deuteronomy 6, Joshua chapter 24. These were the things that they enjoyed as they lived in the blessing of God. Yet according to that exact same covenant that gave them these blessings, when they rebelled against the Lord, when they disregarded his covenant, God would strip those things from them. So instead of experiencing blessing, they would experience cursing. Instead of experiencing abundance, they would experience desolation. All these things, your lands will be no longer no fruitful. Your houses will be empty. All these things you were given are going to be taken from you. All this would begin with Assyria, but there's much more than Assyria in mind. It would be the Babylonians who fully removed the Jews from the land. They would not regain their sovereignty. The Jews wouldn't for several thousand years until 1948. Surely it could be said that their palaces were forsaken. Thankfully, it wouldn't always remain that way. There's a promise of restoration starting in verse 15. Until the Spirit is poured out, excuse me, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted a forest. See, the judgment of God upon his people would be temporary. They would be removed, they would be made to be barren, but there would come a time eventually of restoration. Now, this has happened a few times in the history of Israel. The first was the return after the Babylonian captivities. The Jews have been allowed to return to the land, rebuild their temple, even rebuild their capital city. And by the way, all of it funded by uh, the, the empire that ruled over them at the time. I mean, it was bankroll to them to be able to do it. The nation became fruitful again, though never really attaining to its former glory. And of course, even that was taken away when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD and the Jews scattered to all corners of the earth. It would remain that way again until 1948 when Israel became a sovereign nation again. And today the nation is fruitful. By the way, that's literal. (laughs) It is fruitful. Israel is a massive exporter of fruits and other agricultural goods. It's a very good description of it. Now, when did Isaiah say that this would take place in his prophecy? He said, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. Now, there are two possible interpretations there. Number one, talking perhaps about the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out upon the people of God. Now, there's no doubt that the Holy Spirit was poured out in a new and miraculous way as the church officially received its baptism into existence. Yet, 
that might not be the best fulfillment for this particular prophecy because the church doesn't really have much to do with the physical land of Israel. Now, we could spiritualize this and talk about the meaning of wilderness and the fruitful field to refer to the Gentiles being brought into the church as the people of God, but that really violates the plain meaning of the text and it violates the general context of what's going on here. Isaiah had prophesied how the people would be taken out of the physical land, and he's giving another reference to the land here. So contextually, that's got to be physical. So this isn't likely a reference to Pentecost, even though the Spirit was poured out then. The second interpretation is that this is a reference to the Spirit being poured out upon believing Jews during the millennial kingdom as they experience a blessing of living in that promised land with all the provision that the Lord God gives them in that day. Ezekiel prophesies of a day in which the Lord will pour out His Spirit on the nation of Israel. You read about it in Ezekiel chapter 36. In that day, they will experience a blessing of the Holy Spirit in a similar way that we as a church have experienced it for the last 2,000 years. But again, the point here is that the desolation of the Jews would be temporary. There would be a restoration that's promised. And just as chapter 32 began with prophecies about the future kingdom, it ends with prophecies about the future kingdom. Writes in verse 16, Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, righteousness will remain in the fruitful field, the work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation and secure dwellings and in quiet resting places, though hail comes down on the forest and the city is brought low in humiliation. All the things that would have been taken from the people will be restored. Their barren fields fruitful again. Their trouble, their mourning turn into peace. There wouldn't be any pretense of false ease. There wouldn't be any complacency in the midst of trouble. Instead, they would experience true peace, true quiet, true comfort that's given to them from the Lord. Never again would their habitation be in danger. The Lord would ensure that they would be secure forever. The city might be brought low for now, but they would be a true restoration later. Uh, They were prideful. They had walked away from the Lord in their complacency, but in their humility they'd be restored as the spirit of the living God is poured out among them. Verse 20, Blessed are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. This blessing, by the way, you might notice is in the present tense but it still seems to be a reference to the future kingdom. Things will be peaceful enough to sow their fields with seed and to raise their livestock, and unlike all the times of uncertainty in which they now live, the day of the kingdom of Messiah, they will live in true peace and true security. Now, all these promises about the future kingdom begs the question, if God is so good to his people with the blessings that he's going to pour out in the future, Why would they disregard God and their current struggles with Assyria and other enemies? God gave them immense blessings and promises. What could any other nation possibly offer them in comparison? They had so much in the Lord, they had no reason to turn their eyes towards Egypt or anywhere else. What God gave them was enough, and that was glorious. Of course, if that's true for ancient Judah... No doubt it's true for us today with all the blessings, with all the promises that we have in our Lord Jesus, with all the gifting, with all the empowerment that's available to us through the Holy Spirit, what could possibly entice us to disregard those things to put our trust in the things of the world? And that's so often the choice that we're presented. Trial comes up, people come to us, well-meaning people coming up to us, giving us all sorts of advice that has nothing to do with what the Bible says. In fact, many times it'll be quite the opposite of what the Bible says. But with all the promises, with all the blessing, with the leading of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, why would we possibly turn to those things rather than His things? It makes no sense whatsoever. We compromise. And woe to us because we experience the consequences that come when we fall and we fail. Now, maybe you've been enticed to compromise in some area. Maybe there's something in your life what you're seeking the counsel of the world rather than the counsel of God. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe there's an area in which you become complacent. You're just satisfied with the things that we experience rather than going for the fullness of what God has for you. Now ask the Lord Jesus to help you fix your eyes upon him once again. Ask for a renewed filling of the Holy Spirit. Ask for a right perspective, thinking of the things that he's given and the things that he is rather than the things that we think we might get somewhere else. Let's get renewed in our focus again on the Lord Jesus. 
awake and alive to what he's got right in front of us and also to the promises we have with him in the future.